Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Government of Spain for convening this event and for their continued leadership on the SDGs and the Paris Agreement climate goals. COP25 would not have been possible without the swift action of the Spanish Government and of my good friend, Vice President Teresa Ribera, in particular. Spain was also a key voice in the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit last year, leading the work on a just transition with Peru and the ILO. Never has the issue of a just and a fair transition been more timely and vital. The pandemic has laid bare the structural trends that were shaping our world before COVID-19. On the one side, rising inequalities, risks and temperatures, and on the other, more renewable energy and more digitalization, and more vocal youth and civil society movements. As governments look to restart their economies, they will have to decide which trends to accelerate and embrace and which ones to curb and reverse. The Secretary General has been very clear. The only viable way to recover is by fully implementing the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. In short, to recover better together. To guide this work, he has set out six climate positive actions. Let me recap them here. First, as we spend trillions to recover, we must deliver new jobs and businesses through a clean, green transition. Second, public bailouts should be tied to plans and businesses to align with the Paris Agreement. Third, we must end fossil fuel subsidies and put a price on carbon. Fourth, we must build resilient societies through a just and a fair transition that leaves no one behind. Fifth, climate risks and opportunities must be taken into account in all financial and policy decisions. And sixth, we must work together as an international community. We must leave no one behind. Large-scale investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, clean and sustainable infrastructure, zero carbon transport, and nature-based solutions are all necessary for a better recovery. These solutions will pay for themselves many times over. So will investments in building the resilience of vulnerable communities. These investments also need to go hand in hand with a managed exit from fossil fuels in a way that safeguards energy supply and crucially, the livelihoods of workers. It is vital that we recognize that a green, resilient, fair recovery is a job-rich recovery. The notion that we must choose between climate action and economic strength is a fallacy. The reality is that recovering better is the best way to create more and better jobs. For example, investments in renewable energy yield three times more jobs than investments in fossil fuels. Yet a just transition must be a managed transition. We do have model agreements that can serve as inspiration. Spain, of course, is a leader in managing its transition. The pact between coal miners and the government exemplifies a level of trust and transparency that people deserve everywhere. South Africa could be a role model as well. As the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Minister Mantashe recently said, a just transition pact will accelerate the shutdown of coal power plants. In Nigeria, while faced with a collapse in revenues, the government decided to go ahead with a phased out fossil fuel subsidies, potentially saving billions. It has also invited the Nigerian Labour Congress to develop a national roadmap for implementing the Celestia Declaration on just transition, recognizing that a diversified economy is a more resilient economy. And in Jordan, the government has been easing the pain of phasing out fossil fuel subsidies by a cash transfer safety net to poorer households and public funding for the expanded use of household solar. I urge all governments to develop credible, just transition plans, working with all stakeholders and to embed in these plans into their respective NDCs and long-term decarbonisation strategies. I also encourage all member states to submit their enhanced NDCs and long-term strategies to the UNFCCC way ahead of COP26 in Glasgow. Lastly, international solidarity and a revitalized multilateral architecture will be critical on our path to recover better. We cannot, indeed we must not, leave behind countries that don't have access to the financial and monetary tools of the wealthiest nations. Low and middle income countries will need bilateral and multilateral support to avoid falling into permanent debt traps and downward poverty spirals. I urge all G20 and OECD countries, as well as all development banks, to maintain and even increase their international development finance at this critical moment. I thank you all very sincerely and wish you a fruitful meeting.